So in chapter 12, uh, what you are looking at is the, the source of magnetic field. For the purpose of chapter 11, we kind of assume you have a magnetic field. It comes from somewhere. Maybe it comes from a permanent magnet. Maybe it comes from something else. You just have the field. And we worked out presuming that magnetic field, what should be the interaction between that magnetic field and other things that interact with the magnetic field. And we went to the most uh, fundamental interaction, which is the interaction between magnetic field and a moving charge, um, not a, a dipole magnet, which is a lot more complicated objects than a moving electric charges. So, so with that in chapter 11. Now, so in chapter 12, what we do now is um, address that uh, that uh, question that we left open when we were doing chapter 11. Where does the magnetic field come from? And this is where I want to point out, so, you know, in a physics class, we don't often pay attention to the history of physics. We make terrible historians. We don't really care how something was discovered. We care more about what it is. Um, but I wanted to shine some light on this discovery of the relationship between magnetic field and current because it's a quite complicated relationship. Uh, many different smart people contributed to the discovery and it's, uh, I think it's just good enough to just look at it and marvel at the fact that uh, somehow people are able to make heads and tails of this complicated relationship. So for the discovery of the relationship between magnetic field and current, I actually have to go back to our previous chapter, chapter 11. When you look at section 11.1, .1, magnetism and its historical discoveries, it um, talks about history of magnetism, and it starts from things that were known from ancient Greek times of the lodestone, which was used for compasses and whatnot. So something like a compass needle is something that's been known since antiquity. And what we are going to point to is the modern discovery that looks at the interaction between this compass needle and electrical current. So in this section, there's a paragraph that talks about, ah, here it is. Back in 1819, the Danish physicist Hans Ørsted, I think that's the pronunciation, if I'm wrong. <laughs> Sorry, these, uh, a lot of European names, I'm going to pronounce it like either it's English or German, knowing that that may be wrong. <laughs> Those are the two languages that I know how to pronounce. So Danish physicist Hans Ørsted was performing a lecture demonstration for some students and noticed that a compass needle moved whenever current flowed in a nearby wire. And I don't think it was a quite an accidental discovery as this paragraph um, sounds uh, makes it sound like, because uh, I think uh, there was some suspicion that there was a relationship between magnetic fields and uh, electrical current. So I think he was actually looking for a relationship like this. In any case, um, this is uh, quite, um, it, it takes attention to detail to know this. So what I want to show is a, a lecture demo that, um, it, that reproduces what Ørsted might have uh, observed, except in our setup, uh, it's quite easy to observe because I have a purpose-made device that's designed to illustrate it. So let me show you the video and uh, I'll do a voiceover for the video and, uh, and we'll move on from there to introduce Bio Sabart's law. So this is a lecture demo that's uh, meant to reproduce in some loosely connected way, the discovery that Hans Orst had made. So, um, so what you have here in the middle, that's a compass and needle. So when I start running the video, you will see it behave like a compass and needle. So as I turn this apparatus in one direction or the other, the compass needle it continues mostly to point in the same direction. There's a little bit of a friction between the support and the needle, so it um, does end up moving a little bit. But when I bring everything to rest, um, this needle kind of swings back and, uh, swings back and forth um, where 
the equilibrium position is pointing towards the wall. So the, when I recorded this, the direction of the wall is the southward direction. So this blue needle is pointing to south. Ah. And now is the demonstration with electrical current. I turned on this apparatus, which is designed to, uh, so it has a loop of current that it, the wires are not shown directly here but there's a <laughs> loop of current and this light is indicating in what direction the current is flowing. So this is indicating the current should be flowing in counterclockwise direction. Uh, as soon as I turn up the dial, so this current needle moves from its zero position right now. So, so there's gonna be current flowing this in this wire, loop of wire, both here and the one in the back. And you will see the behavior of this needle change as more current begins to flow. So watch. So it almost looks like the needle is being held um, in that direction. And you can see that as I rotate the apparatus, that it's uh, rotating, um, rotating with the, um, uh, or the needle is rotating with the apparatus. So whatever force is holding onto this compass needle, which we assume is magnetic force, it's associated with that, uh, with the apparatus. That's the um, purpose of the rotating the apparatus so that you can see how it, uh, uh, there's something in the apparatus which contains no magnet, but has a, a current flowing in loops of wire that uh, something is producing a magnetic field. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to reverse the direction of magnetic, I'm sorry, reverse the direction of current and watch what happens. I reverse the direction of current. So the current, when I turn the dial so that the current begins to flow, the current will now flow in the clockwise direction. And remember what I said about this blue end of the compass needle pointing to south? Now, let's see what happens as I turn up the current. It reverses direction. It's going to swing back and forth quite a bit, so I just made it stop so they stop doesn't swing back and forth so much. As I increase current, you can see that it looks like this is being held around this point. And as I move the apparatus, the needle uh, rotates with the apparatus, indicating that it, um, there's a magnetic field that's uh, fixed uh, with how the apparatus is set up. And when I turn, on, turn off the current, the needle goes back to the previous um, orientation with the south end pointing towards the wall, which is in the southward direction. So that's the demo, and I have a little bit more recorded, but uh, you know, when I turn off, turn on and turn off this uh, product, there's something, the company needle is quite sensitive, so I, um, it was doing weird things, so <laughs> I think I'm just gonna stop it here. So, so that's the demonstration. This is illustrating what um, Ersted's um, uh, discovery was. And I think a compass needle is useful for visualizing the direction of magnetic field. So uh, we're, you know, stepping back a little bit from what we talked about in chapter 11 about the magnetic force being V cross B. Um, I think if we use this intuition for how the direction of compass needle is related to the direction of magnetic field. So th this is an illustration of a bar magnet, which I hope you have some sense of familiarity to, to and how the direction of the compass uh, gives you a sense of the direction of magnetic field. It, you can almost uh, imagine the compass as a kind of an arrow or a, well, needle or an arrow. So if you follow those arrows and trace out what the direction of magnetic field looks like here. Um, so, you know, magnetic field coming out of North Pole, magnetic field going into South Pole and the in-between region, just following these arrows, the kind of fields you see here, I hope that um, seems familiar. It's the dipole field that you have seen in electrostatic and before electrostatics uh, field pattern that looks like this. This is something that 
um, you might have seen visualized in a high school physics class or science class with iron filings around the R magnet. And, um, and I wanted to point to this to say, when you saw the compass needles uh, pointing in different directions with that apparatus involving electrical current, the direction of compass needle is what indicates the direction of magnetic field. You can just uh, directly associate it that way, and it'll be good enough for at least uh, figuring out the direction of magnetic field. You can, um, in an analogy with your electrostatics, you can almost imagine this as consisting of a North Pole and a South Pole, and this North Pole is repelling the North Pole and attracting the South Pole. I mean, there's a more nuance there, but that's good enough of a picture when we are trying to observe the direction of magnetic field. So let me sketch out what we saw with the apparatus. And once I draw the sketch, I hope I think you can see how different it is from the electrostatic phenomena. So this is the um, illustration of, I'm just going to put in quotes, Ersted's experiment. I mean, I'm sure his experiment was in a different setup, but it's close enough how uh, electrical current affects the magnet, the affects the compass. It's good enough for that. So uh, we have these two pictures where um, I guess, do I want to draw? Let me imagine drawing a top-down view. So in the top-down view, um, in the first case, we had we had a disorientation of compass. Uh, south end was um, pointed away from me, and north end was pointed towards me. And uh, we had two loops of current. Uh, from a top-down view, those loops of current would uh, look like this. And help us uh, imagine the three-dimensional um, direction of current and everything. Um, I can say, the, so the current was flowing counterclockwise, counterclockwise. So as I look at it from the top, on the right side of the current, it should be coming uh, towards me. And on the left-hand side of the current, it would be going away from me. And it's the same direction for both coils. So this is what we had in uh, first case, case one. So in that picture, somehow this arrangement of current somehow resulted in a magnetic field. So if my compass needle is oriented this way, the magnetic field must be pointed this way, in a rough sense, somewhere in the center region where the compass needle was. Okay, that's a quick case one. Let me draw the picture for the case two because it's quite similar yet different. We reverse the direction of current. So as we are looking at it, instead of going counterclockwise, the current was going clockwise. So if we imagine looking at it from above, the on the right hand side, the current was uh, going away from us. So the direction of current was uh, away or into the page here. And, um, and on the other side, it would be coming towards us. So, so that's uh, describing the clockwise current that we established. Same for both coils. And what we saw was the this compass needle was reversed in direction. The south end was now pointing towards us, not away from us. So we have south here and north here. And that direction of compass needle means our magnetic field was pointed away from us as we are imagining standing on the, so this is the experimenter side and we are imagining looking at it from above. Now, I want you to imagine what, what a comparable situation involving Coulomb's law would have looked like. So if you had a ring of charge here, and you had a ring of charge here, somewhere in the middle, um, the electric field due to these charge, 
due to these charges would have kind of balanced each other out. And somewhere in the middle, your electric field would have been zero. And in any case, um, in this uh, hypothetical picture, thinking of similar arrangement involving electric charges, um, the one thing that you wouldn't have expected is for um, whatever field that's produced to have this kind of a directional dependence. And looking at it, this, looking at here, just to draw one more picture for case one. So this is the picture that we had for case one. Um, we had a current that was flowing counterclockwise. And somewhere around here, we had a magnetic field that's pointing towards us. So we had a magnetic field that looks like this. Um, it's a, it's not any kind of direction that we would have guessed. Uh, for an electric field in this setup, electric field of, would have maybe pointed somewhere towards like central, center directed direction. And what this is getting at is the um, uh, rather complicated relationship between uh, direction of moving charge and the other geometry considerations and um, and the direction of magnetic field. There are those three vectors involved and their relative directions are not as simple as what we have said for electrostatics. In, with the Coulomb's law, the, the relationship between the different spatial orientations and direction of field, they were super simple. If you have a source of charge here and you are looking at that point, the direction that points to that point is my R hat vector and my electric field pointed in that direction. This was what we saw with the Coulomb's law and it was uh, super simple. And this uh, resulted in the Coulomb's law expression, which um, even in vector notation, we can state it in a kind of a simple way. It Once we've written it down, it's not something that someone looks at and thinks, oh, that looks super complicated. We, our uh, Coulomb's law was, um, let me write down the version for electric field. Our Coulomb's law was that, well, Coulomb constant times the amount of charge divided by R squared, inverse square law, times for the direction, R hat vector. So kind of as simple as it can be. And, with the magnetic field, what I hope this demonstration is showing is that um, the relationship is not going to be that simple. We cannot say that the magnetic field points in the direction of current. We can't even say um, somehow there's a direct um, simple relationship between the segment of this current carrying wire which generates the field and uh, this uh, R hat vector that points from the source to the point where you are establishing the magnetic field. And I will just uh, leave you there here, which is that uh, it took <laughs> a lot of smart people doing very careful experiments to somehow figure out this relationship. And we are gifted <laughs> with this fundamental relationship, which is as simple as it can be, given the complicated nature of the interaction. And this uh, simplest as can be relationship is known as Biot Savart's law. And it's got some pieces that are complicated. Um, one is, let me write it down first and then we'll talk through it. So, um, so the infinitesimal amount of magnetic field that's uh, generated by infinitesimal um, uh, segment of current is given by, and I'm trying to remember the coefficient in front here. Um, I think it's a Coulomb constant divided by C squared times. And we have the, and this is how it's usually written. I indicating the amount of current in whatever circuit you are looking at times, and we put the directional quantity in the segment, um, the 
the line segment element of the wire, DL, cross R hat divided by R squared. And on the, all, all, all the complexity that I was describing, it's wrapped into this relationship between the direction of magnetic field and the direction of DL, which is the segment, um, segment, line segment that points in the direction of current. And you see how this direction is changing as you go around this loop cross product with the R hat. So in this picture, our R hat, for this segment here, this would be the R hat here. So, so that's the complicated uh, uh, directional relationship. And I think once it's written down, then it's not so surprising that this direction of this vector, this vector, and this vector are related through cross product, which means, um, the direction of magnetic field is guaranteed to be, um, at least for a little segment, it's perpendicular to R hat vector and it's perpendicular to the direction of current. And uh, at least when you imagine that there's enough of a complexity that you can imagine how it'll work out. Um, now, I have a separate lecture video where I draw out this uh, detailed comparison between um, the Coulomb's law and the uh, uh, bio savart law. And I think this comparison is useful for making sense of this complicated looking expression. Because uh, one of the similarities I can note is Coulomb's law was an inverse square law. And even though this uh, gets uh, buried in detailed uh, derivations from time to time, or most of the time, bio savart law also describes the magnetic field as an inverse square law. The reason this inverse square nature of magnetic field is not always apparent is it's kind of wrapped in here. Whenever you are calculating magnetic field, it has to come from an extended current distribution. There is no such a thing as a point current. So our application of bio savart law and other derivation of magnetic field will necessarily be complicated. It'll have to be more complicated than the magnet, the electric field of a point charge was. So let me wrap up this video by uh, showing how the, um, 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 how the, the directional information that's given here is consistent with what we experimentally observed. So let me use this picture to work out the right-hand rule for um, uh, for magnetic field inside this loop here. So I have the direction of current, which is going uh, counterclockwise. So let me just uh, take this point here. So for that point, my DL, um, my DL is uh, pointing downward. And uh, for R hat, R hat is pointing to the right. So I want to say DL cross R hat is pointing um, uh, is pointing out of the screen. That's your perspective, and that is correct perspective. And that matches the direction of magnetic field that we see here. Now, you might wonder, what about uh, points on the uh, other points along the loop? If I take this point here, for example, so DL points in that direction, and R hat points in this direction, let's just try it. So I want my right hand to be pointed kind of right and upward. Okay, so that's the direction of DL. And let me try to orient my hand so that I can bend my fingers in the direction of R hat, which is the kind of left toward and up. So this is the orientation of my hand that where direction of my thumb gives the direction of B. And yeah, it's still out of the screen. So as you go around a counterclockwise direction, um, your hand is originally pointing in the direction of DL and our head is pointing radially into the center and direction of magnetic field uh, points out of the screen. And in the case of case two, uh, your direction of our head remains the same, but your hand, instead of doing the counterclockwise thing, now it does the clockwise thing. So, you know, um, so 
So yeah, so as you are handles the clockwise thing, if your DL points this way, the center is here, R head points this way, so your thumb points into the screen and that's what you got with the magnetic field into the page. So, so yeah, that's uh, um, introduction to Biot-Savart's law with its uh, complicated looking <laughs> expression. And oh, to connect this to the other lecture, so this is something that I started doing um, based on uh, feedback from an experienced physics teacher, which and he had a, a advice for trying to continue using Coulomb constant past the initial um, introduction of Coulomb's law and the uh, uh, Gauss's law. A lot of textbooks will switch at some point from using Coulomb constant to the permittivity of free space. So Coulomb's law would be written like one over four pi epsilon naught. Uh, Q over R squared R hat. Um, and uh, this uh, approach does make Gauss's law look simpler. And um, so, uh, so, so, I mean, th there's a justification for it. Now, and uh, it, with uh, this approach, when you get to Biot-Savart's law, Biot-Savart's will would be written in this form. It would be written as mu naught over four pi times everything else, ideal plus r hat over r squared. So, so, um, so in, in this approach where you switch to using permittivity of free space, you introduce this magnetic constant, uh, which is called permeability of free space and I guess when you look at here, the um, the downside of using these um, separate constants is that um, it doesn't highlight as well the unified nature of electricity and magnetism, which is what we are getting at, getting to by the end of the semester. And in this approach of writing down, this particular set of constants. I hope you look at this Coulomb constant and wonder, wasn't that an electric constant? Why is it doing it in an expression for magnetic field? Well, it belongs there for a very good reason that you will see by the end of the semester. And this is a new constant that I'm introducing. C here, it stands for speed of light. And as you hear it, I hope you wonder what's light got to do with anything. There's no light involved here. Well, there is, and we'll get to it by the end of the semester. And um, and, and that's why I'm switching to continuing to use Coulomb constant throughout the entire semester. That I hope it'll highlight for you, it'll foreshadow for you some of the things that are coming up. So with that, oh, well, I went way over time. I might have to just... Uh, watch this and possibly re-record. Um, but anyways, um, so that's it. Let me stop my recording here. And uh, uh, thank you to those of you <laughs> watching through the end of this virtual class session. And I will see you next time.